Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us, and welcome to our uh, update. Uh, today, we're just going to have a. Uh, I'm joined by Kenneth from our Mortgage North Key office, uh, investment advisor uh, in that office. Kenneth's going to give you an update on the just the investment markets, just a, a bit of a review. We've just passed the reporting season, and um, you know what's been happening and where we see things moving ahead. And after Kenneth, I'll just give you just a quick update on some um, a bill that's been introduced and Parliament, just in respect of the downsizing incentives for uh, seniors. So, um, so without you, I'll just let Kenneth uh, kick off his presentation. Thanks, Mark. Just go through the usual general disclaimer. And, uh, look, for us, this is one of the most important times of, of, of the year. Uh, it's a, a time when we get to see how, how companies have gone throughout the, the financial year. But more importantly, it also gives guidance for, for how they're looking for the for, for, for the year ahead. So what I thought I'd do to start off with is, is take a bit of a macro look and see uh, how uh, the companies went on, on their previous uh, financial year. So look, if you look down to the bottom uh, right, uh, that is showing you how these companies have gone through uh, each reporting season from uh, two, February 2016. Now the, the misses you can see this year were, were actually quite small. Um, a lot more companies were, were, were within guidance, which is the which is the grey area over there. And then um, finally the beats. Now the, the, the beats were also smaller, but for us, looking through that, we did note that expectations were quite high going into this reporting season. Um, uh, and, and, and what I mean by that is uh, analysts through the whole uh, market had their, had their earnings guidances put in and whether or not the, the companies were, were, were able to hit that is, is, is what we're looking at there. So uh, the, the one on the left, uh, it just gives you a little bit of a, uh, a view of how it went through reporting season. So what normally happens is the beats coming at the start and we, we, we didn't see that uh, this year. Uh, it was uh, a, a bit of a change really towards the back end. Um, a lot more uh, a lot more of the companies that um, uh, were able to beat uh, market expectations came through at the back end. Uh, and look for us, um, one of the one of the key standouts really was the resource sector. So once they've reported, we thought we thought it uh, interesting to show you what what happens once that happens. So, look if if you look down to the bottom left, we've just compiled a little bit of a table there with some of the companies that, that either beat or missed guidance. So they are in the green or the red section. As you can see, the the performance since they reported, they they look to have continued on, and we we think that's. Uh, becoming more and more prevalent in our market. And, and so what that means for us is the momentum train on, on, on either beats or misses seems to continue on through the, through the next six months. And, and really it's only been about you know, two or three weeks. So really you wanna be on a couple of those. <clears throat> What's interesting though, is the market itself actually hasn't gone really anywhere. And it's been, it's been trading in a very tight range for really three or four months. Um, to us, that see, that, that, that's telling us that on a, on a macro level, we're, we're, we're quite trapped, but on a stock specific level, there is a lot of action going through. Now, expectations ahead. For us, very important. Um, this, this allows analysts to, have, uh, to produce their numbers and, and, and to cross check on numbers. Uh, going into the 17-18 financial year. Um, look, uh, like I said, uh, uh, higher, higher, higher expectations were going in, um, but going forward, they seem to have reduced it down a little bit. Um, so guidance itself, I suppose, was a little bit disappointing in, in that area for the reporting season. This um, chart down below, shows you, and it might look a little bit confusing, but hopefully it's not too much. It, it, it shows you that the different sectors of our market, what their earnings growth is projected to. 
to their forecast for 17, point, uh, 17 18 financial year and the, and the relative trading uh, PE multiple, so price to earning multiple that they're trading on. Um, I, I think it, uh, for the most part, um, it, it sort of shows that higher expectations on earnings lead to higher valuations. Um, and it's a, a very important thing that we need to, to look at as, as in, uh, investment uh, professionals. Um, the, I, I think a couple of standouts there, you, you most probably notice that the telcos, um, very underloved at the moment. Uh, as a sector, it's the lowest trading um, uh, sector on a multiple basis. Um, and then the other one that I thought uh, was, was worth mentioning was, was healthcare. Um, it, it looks like it trades on quite a lofty multiple compared to its earnings, but you've got to also take into account the, the sort of structural tailwinds that are behind some of these companies. And look, fixed interest market, um, and I'll touch on a few of these in a little bit more detail uh, in the next couple of slides, but from when we last spoke uh, in February, um, we were looking at a rising bond yield environment. So over the last couple of months, uh, political tensions uh, have sort of uh, come to the forefront of, uh, of the media and, and we have seen uh, bond yields slightly fall down. That looks to have bottomed. Um, it does look like there's been very uh, uh, strong uh, support um, for this uh, I suppose, rising bond yield theme, um, and, and we expect that to continue. We're seeing it in the hybrid market. Uh, the, the, the hybrid market has, um, we feel, become a lot more commonplace in, our, in, in, in the domestic market, and people are becoming more and more um, comfortable with these sort of investments. Um, it's really continued on from, from uh, February. Quite a strong bid up in, in prices uh, and, and, and we don't see that uh, tailing away. We think there's um, a definite demand for floating rate um, and I'll touch on that a little bit later um, uh, as well, but floating rate instruments, uh, what they do is they, they sort of give you an, an inflation hedge. What should happen is that they're, their distribution should increase as rates increase or as interbank lending rates increase. Um, and then finally, um, new products are coming to market as well. Uh, and we think this is a great area to have a look at. Uh, it's, for us, diversification in, in, in any sector of the market is important. And this allows uh, retail investors to, to, to really be able to do that in the fixed interest sector. <coughs> So just touched on it before, portfolio construction um, uh, for us very important, um, particularly in this area. What we try and uh, achieve is, you know, take a long-term approach. Um, don't don't just look at the highest yield possible, um, and 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 really try and diversify across some hybrids, some corporate debt, and even look at some uh, corporate bond exposure. Um, TDs. I suppose they've been um, uh, low for quite some time, but again, we we feel that there's uh, a, an important place for, for term deposits in a, in a in a diversified portfolio in, in the fixed interest sector. So this uh, is is really going back to where interest rates uh, or, or are, are headed, um, or, or or how the market believes they're headed. Um, we I've touched on this before, but in February, um, looking at that rising bond yield, so people are thinking that the yield curve is going to go up. And this interest rate swap curve, um, I think, really shows this quite, quite well. So if you look at the dotted blue line, that was one year ago, and that was the expectations on that. That was the swap curve one year ago. And that shows where people thought rates were going over you know, 90, up to 10 years. If you look at the current, which is the, the, the full uh, dark blue line, that, that's, that's where we are currently now and where expectations are looking at. It is a, a very, very big move up um, and we don't, uh, we don't think it's going to fall back down. This is not, it's not going to happen really quickly, but we do think that general trend is going to continue 
year on year. So look, a few key picks in this space. Um, we've got a few hybrids in there. Uh, there's a reset uh, preference share as well. And uh, there's also a corporate, um, a corporate bond fixed interest note. Uh, Villa World. Um, all of these are quite happy with uh, at, the, at the current levels, um, but of course uh, the, these things can change. So <clears throat> domestic and global growth outlook ties in well with the rising bond yield theme. Uh, we think the general trend on both is, is, is up um, and look year on year uh, 16 to 17, if you look down to that right hand side, um, I think there's a, a very clear trend across most major economies um, that we see in, in GDP, um, with GDP rising, uh, hopefully, and, and this is this is the one that's lacking, is there's wage inflation should start to push up, um, and that should push the consumer price inflation. Um, really two main areas that I think are, are worth looking at, uh, US and the Euro area. Um, both have seen, I, I would call, a marked pickup um, in CPI from 16 to 17, uh, particularly the euro area. Uh, I think that, look, uh, while they've, they've still got QE going um, and, and the, the general trend of their economic um, uh, economic data, sorry about that, um, is, is strong, I think that's going to continue to push up. Look, we think that, uh, as as always, that, uh, that it's not going to be straight. It's not a straight line, um, and there are still political risks that, are, that that could unravel this. But um, for us, quite a strong strong set of data over the past twelve months. Commodities uh, really, uh, I suppose, important to our domestic uh, market. Um, we clearly very heavily weighted in financials and uh, commodities. Um, for us, one of, the, one of the main standouts has been copper. Copper, which is usually seasonally weak during this time, has uh, rocketed along. Uh, it's uh, from last check, I believe it was up about uh, 14 or 15% over the past two months. Um, it has tailed off a little bit over the past couple of days, but we think that, and you might've heard of it, uh, Dr. Copper, um, if global growth is going up, copper should rise with it. Um, we're seeing that in the data now, um, and we don't expect that trend to stop. Iron ore has also been quite resilient, um, usually a weaker time, uh, particularly over from about May to September. Um, we, we really haven't seen a major drop off um, in iron ore, but uh, look, supply is, is still coming on, and if China is hitting its numbers, which it is, um, we expect that there's, you know, not 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 going to be a huge run up in prices, but it should stabilise around here. Our, um, um, I suppose our, our our thesis on on iron ore comes back to the quality of the company. Uh, we've seen a lot of these mining stocks uh, do massive cost outs, um, and it's really showing in their reports at the moment. Oil, uh, it's been a, a, a laggard. Um, definitely off its lows, which is which is great to see. We, we came off that 2014, 2015 uh, drop in the oil price. Um, it's it, it's now basing itself between about 40 to 60 dollars. Uh, we haven't seen it move past, um, but we are confident in the fact that uh, look again, it comes back to global growth. You, you you look at that oil consumption should be going up, and long and 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 now at least the trend. Uh, seems to be in the right direction. Key themes and beyond uh, for 2017. Uh, what we discussed earlier, try and hit those structural tailwinds with, with healthcare. Um, we, we do really like uh, some uh, technology and it's quite hard to replicate uh, on, on the domestic market for, for mature companies. We, we, we look at offshore uh, either direct or, or via ETFs. So one that uh, I think uh, will continue to perform quite well is the NASDAQ ETF. Um, uh, back on the bond yields, just be mindful of, of, of what's been called the great rotation. Um, 
overweight positions in utilities, uh, infrastructure companies. They, they, they've been bid up for quite, quite some time and it's not as if we don't like some of those. It's just the position size that, that, that it really comes back back to. So just uh, we, we're just a little cautious on them. Um, again, back to commodities, BHP, Oz Minerals, um, both I think had a very good report, um, very strong free cash flow uh, on both of those. So very happy there. Um, and then in the oil space, Oil Search, it's been a range trader for going on two years now. Um, we really like it around these levels uh, and we think that the long-term uh, prospect for that company is quite high. Um, for income focused investors, have a look outside the financials uh, for, 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 for companies that can deliver on their, on, on their dividends um, and then back on uh, the momentum. So stocks that beat, beat guidance, uh, upgraded their earnings and trying to get on that momentum tailwind. Look, one thing that we need to uh, point out to everyone is volatility uh, continues to be exceptionally low. So not much has changed in that area from, from February to now. Um, and, and for us, in this sort of political environment, uh, it's very, very important to look at your asset allocation. And finally, on my side, um, we run the, the North Key model portfolios. Um, this is just, a, I suppose, an, an overall view of, of how they've been going over the past, uh, you know, one, three, and five years. Um, what they try and do is, is uh, try and deliver um, what the what the investors want in in return of either an income or a growth or a little bit of both. So. Um, there's an investment committee that uh, oversees these um, and uh, that comprises of uh, Morgan's research, um, institutional dealing teams and, and corporate as well. So they're the three equity models. And then finally, um, we, we also run a fixed interest model and this is just how it's gone against its, uh, its benchmark. So I think that's about it from me and I'll pass over to uh, Mark. Uh, just before you go, Kenneth, I've just got a query here from an attendee. Um, they hold Telstra and CBA, which is which is probably not that uncommon. Quite topical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they've seen a value drop off. Is there any reason for concern? Oh, look. So I'll start on um, CBA first off. One, one company that I think had a fantastic report. Um, record cash earnings. Uh, return on equity, which is uh, a measure of how, how a company puts its, uh, I suppose, equity to work, uh, was still at around 16%. Um, uh, the, the big overhang there is, is clearly the Austrac. For us, we've actually seen CBA over the past two months really come back towards the, the valuations of other banks. Um, CBA normally trades on a premium to other banks. Uh, and, and the reason for that is it's high return on equity. Um, I, I actually think that it's, it's, it's offering fairly good value here. Uh, yields are about 8.5% or just a little under. Westpac, NAB are around that mark as well. Um, uh, it's really just the uncertainty of Austrac that's, that's holding that, that company back. Um, and, and look, at, at these current levels, we, we're quite, um, I suppose, quite comfortable with how the financials are going. Uh, now Telstra, unfortunately, um, cut its dividend and everyone everyone knows about that now. Um, look, again, it comes down to valuation. And for us at 11 times, it's an 8.5% yield at 360. I, I think it's fair value. Um, I, I wouldn't be uh, selling it at these prices. Um, for, for us, it's a it's a company that really businesses can't wake up with Telstra in Australia. Um, they have uh, cash flow coming through from the MBN out to 2020. That once that happens, yes, it's in a competitive environment, and yes, there might be, you know, some uh, you know earnings or EBITDA creep, um, but uh, I think it's a hold. Um, I, I, I just think valuation comes into terms with this. So, thank you very much. No All right.
Okay, um, just onto a more um, probably less interesting topic, but uh, nonetheless just as important for certain people. I'm going to just give a, a quick update on the downsizing and incentives for seniors. Um, uh, a bill was recently introduced into Parliament. Uh, this is part of the, um, the reducing pressure on housing affordability. So uh, part of the 2017 budget, um, the federal government had some um, incentivising program which allowed um, uh, Australians to downsize their family home and um, allowing them to put that money into super. So I'll just go into more detail. So what it's about um, is really from 2018, 1 July 2018. Um, just bear in mind that it's not law yet, but um, uh, from 1 July 2018, individuals over 65 will be able to make personal contributions up to 300,000. So that's per individual. Um, only from the, the, the sale proceeds from their family home. And that family home needs to be owned for at least 10 years. Um, importantly, these contributions are over and above uh, the other voluntary contributions caps that's in place. Um, and it, it only applies to those contracts for the sale of those properties that have been entered into on or after 1 July 2018. So um, again, it's uh, it's only a once once off uh, once only application, <coughs> excuse me, and it can't be used for the sale of future uh, principal places of residence. So, uh, so it's subject to three hundred thousand per individual, um, but as part of that process, they can make multiple contributions, um, and it can only be made as it's stated there, just from the from the proceeds from that dwelling. So, how does that compare to where we are at the moment? Um, for to, to enable individuals to make non-concessional contributions into super, uh, under the age 65, it's not, not a concern, but over the age 65 and between that age of up to 74, an individual needs to submit a work test. That work test is 40 hours within 30 consecutive days. Now, that demonstration of gainful employment allows them to make what's called a non-concessional contribution. So that's an after-tax contribution. Now the cap on that at the moment is 180,000. Um, under 65, you can actually bring forward two years, so you can put three years worth of contributions. Sorry, not 180,000, 100,000. 180,000 was the old one. From 1 July 17, it's actually dropped back to 100,000. So my correction. Um, so uh, under 65, you can bring two years forward, so you can make three years worth of contributions of that 100,000 from 1 July 17, which is a uh, 300,000 once off and you can't contribute until that expires. But because you need to meet a work test over the age 65, you can only do the one year, so that's 100,000, and uh, you can't bring forward because you can't demonstrate at that point in time you're gonna meet the work test, you know, the following, or the subsequent years. Uh, and over 75, you're not allowed to make such contributions regardless of your work arrangements. Um, the other thing that, that plays into this is, is from 1 July 2017, um, the after-tax personal contributions are also limited with people with members balance over 1.6 million. Uh, that 1.6 million is part of that transfer balance cap that was introduced. Um, also, um, in respect of, uh, that's a maximum that, uh, uh, you can have a purchase price of annuity. So in other words, it's a maximum of your member's balance that you can roll into pension phase from 1 July uh, 17. So that, that has potential for indexations going forward. So that's where we sit at the moment. Oh, just try and get this forward, there you go. Um, so what, this, what the, the downsizing measures enables is some restrictions of that contributions for those, particularly those over the age 65, um, that don't meet a work test to enable to get some proceeds into superannuation. Um, so recap, regardless of their, their work situation, um, so long as their home's been held for a minimum of 10 years, you're over 65, you can put it as an individual from the proceeds of that property up to 300,000 into super. So as a couple, um, and the 300,000 is really what, what the current non-concessional cap for an individual is if you're under 65 and you trigger those bring forward provisions. So, um, so uh, as a couple, 
that enables you know in a, you know, a family to get six hundred thousand into super from downsizing their home um, to help fund their their retirement. Uh, one little catch there is that it must be made that contribution must be made within ninety days of the disposal of that home, um, or, or such time the commissioner allows. But for for all intents and purposes, we work off ninety days. Uh, you know, there are some other things to consider. Um, social security implications uh, is one of them. Um, so obviously, you know, that needs to be taken into consideration before, you know, downsizing and, and going down the path of looking to contribute to super. Uh, particularly at the moment, um, a family home is exempt for income and asset uh, security purposes, so for the tests. And so what happens is um, the remaining sale of those proceeds, so if you downsize the home and and bought a new home and the, the excess proceeds, they're gonna be accessible for Centrelink purposes um, under either income or asset test, uh, regardless of whether they're put into super or not. So I, I guess the important aspect of that there is, you know, by by going down a, a you know, depends on the, of course, of the, you know, the significance of the, the home and the, and the excess capital that's, that's been generated there or investable capital that's been generated, but the downsizing of a home and this strategy does put more money, more accessible capital outside of the home. And therefore, uh, it could result in an individual or couple losing all or even some of some of their um, uh, their pension benefits. If it's all, then uh, the access to the pension card, concession card would be lost. So for some individuals, that's significant. Uh, quick case study, just to, to you know, um, Put the, uh, the the proposed changes into practical terms. Um, just a simple one here: Jeff and Helen, uh, 80 and 76, respectively, had their health for more held their home for more than 35 years. So importantly, that's more than 10 years. So so one, they qualify there. Home valued at 1.4, and at the moment, it's exempt for social security assessment. Uh, each of them have a, a currently an account based pension. Jeff's 350,000, Helen's 105,000, and both draw minimum pensions based on their age. So that's 7% for Jeff uh, because he's 80 and 6% for Helen at the age of 76. And um, some incidental cash there, $5,000. So currently, uh, as you can see, the family home's not assessed. The account-based pensions um, and the cash, it, the account-based pensions as a minimum pension produces uh, 30,800, and the um, the age pension produces um, just over 28,000. So, as a couple, they get into their 58, 59,000 um, dollars income, which which might be suffice for them. If they wanted to increase that income and they did downsize their home, um, and they sold their home for 1.4, and this, in this example, we've just had them reinvest that proceeds into a new home for 800. Which frees up the six hundred thousand, and conveniently, that's three hundred thousand uh, each for them to contribute into to super. Um, so we just assume that they they both put um, within the ninety days, they put three hundred thousand in uh, to each account based pension, and they've continued to draw under their minimum annual payments that they're currently drawing. So the seven percent and the six percent. So overall, you know. The account-based pensions produce a, um, a higher income, but what it does do is it puts them outside the eligibility of the income and asset test for the purpose of um, the age pension. So whilst their income has increased for sixty-nine thousand, they've lost some the um, the concession. So I guess it's important as an individuals or as a couple to. Taken into consideration for you know embarking on such a strategy to see what implications that has, uh, and to seek advice around that. Um, so yes, they've resulted in more income in the overall strategy, uh, but they have lost a pension. And I think the other thing is to put it in perspective is that you know it shouldn't be looked in isolation. So uh, there are other things to take into consideration. One of those things is actually you know their estate plan and their bequeath their bequeathing. Um, wishes. So if they've, they've downsized their home and they've put that money into super, um, if the, it was have increased their income, if the investment return on those monies are, 
aren't hitting the, the targets of 7 and 6%, plus inflation potentially. Um, really, they're living out of their capital, and so they're, they're actually, it's part, potentially part of their capital, so it's actually might impact their longer term plans or the state plans and, and some other flexibility that, that they might want down the track. And some of that might actually be, um, you know, their wishes around aged care and, and those sort of things as well. So, so the broader, the, the broader holistic view of their overall positions um, and not just uh, not just looking at this strategy in isolation is, is you know what we would certainly recommend um, I suppose you know they're still subject to the 1.6 million uh, pension transfer balance cap so if you have if the members in this case you know the example they didn't but if members had uh, in excess of 1.6 million that's per individual so 1.6 million each in pension um you're ineligible to contribute so the downsizing um you know would would basically force that money um into a accessible environment so depending on the level is depending on you know whether whether that's in a tax effective environment or not and what other income that they might have so taking that broader that broader approach to their strategy is um certainly we something we advocate um, so that's all from me. So that's just a, a quick update on that, um, uh, the bill being introduced to Parliament and what, what it may mean. It doesn't come into effect until 1 July 2018. Um, and thank you, Kenneth, for, um, uh, for the market update. If you do have any queries, and we thank you certainly for, um, uh, for logging in to our presentation. If you do have any queries, um, look, feel free to email um, Kenneth or myself. Uh, or contact our general office number, or um, and you know, you know we're happy to uh, to answer those questions or, or have a chat. Um, other than that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.